All right, well, if there are no questions on that, we can come back to it later, too. Let's do some logistic regression. And I'm mostly going to focus tonight on the statistical analysis, not log used as a mathematical tool for machine learning. All right. Okay. So tonight we're going to talk about grammatical slots. So how do we predict what word should come next? Right. So we could, um, you know, we could think about this as like a, a bigram problem where if I have the previous word, there's a probability of the next set of possible words. I could think about this as a, a basically a Markov chain Monte Carlo, which is kind of what people assume Google search algorithm is. Or I can go even simpler and just think about logistic regression. Can I predict when a certain word will occur given the scenario of the themes in that sentence? And so this allows us to understand word choice based on kind of contextual features. This is going to be kind of similar to our conditional inference tree where we're doing geek versus nerd, where um, instead we are trying to predict the category rather than splitting the data. Okay. So this has a lot of similarities to inference trees, um, except the data isn't binary partitioned, it's just the data and you use it to predict. So you give up, come up with these uh, slope values. Okay. <clears throat> so the biggest issue, uh, I feel like natural language processing, the biggest issue is polysemes, or sometimes called synonymy. Because um, how do we decide what word we should use when there are multiple words that have the same similar meaning? No, I don't think any word is perfectly exchangeable, otherwise we wouldn't have both of them. But there are plenty of things that we could put into a grammatical slot or an empty space in a sentence that would satisfy meaning. So how do we pick which one we, we choose? Okay. So I'm not going to the mall anytime soon because we're still stuck in the red here, but um, let's say blank go to the mall this week. I planned to go to the mall this week. That implies that it didn't happen, right? I decided to go to the mall this week, meaning, you know, um, I um, looked at my schedule and thought it would work, or I scheduled to go to the mall this week. It sounds very formal, very jobby. Okay. But in theory, they're all synonyms because they tell you about going to doing something, okay. or I'm going to go. So got she is very, let's look at synonym adjectives. Pretty, beautiful, pretty seems younger, beautiful seems older, alluring seems a different context. Okay. But in theory, these are all synonyms. How do we pick which one to use? So let's look at some more examples. May versus might, I may, the dog may stop barking. The dog might start barking. barking. <laughs> It depends on the level of certainty that one has about the scenario. I don't know what he's barking at. We might have to drug him. Gown versus dress. That's a lot of different formality, right? Wedding gowns seem more formal than prom dresses. Soda versus Coke versus pop. That's more of a cultural phenomenon. Okay, so um, soda is pretty ubiquitous across the north and the west. Right, the South pretty much calls everything a Coke. I am from the South. This is truth. Right, um, the Northeast is more pop flavored. So I have tried very hard to call, learn how to call everything a soda, because asking for a Coke gets you a Coke. And I think if you've been watching long enough, it's clear I drink Diet Coke. <laughs> or when I was in Texas, more Dr Pepper. Hey, so if you're ever in the South and you ask for a Coke, they might ask you what kind. Let's say Coke again. And so to get into the language use of this are these causative constructions. We're going to use causative constructions as an example multiple times because they're very interesting in understanding how people process cause and effect. Cause and effect is one of the strongest determinants of whether we understand a narrative, right? which right now is super important. Understanding narratives in this time period, like why things are happening the way they're happening and the relationship between A and B is obviously very useful. Um, 
but most of these kinds of constructions are more for like storytelling. And so in English, this would be might, ha uh, might have, get, cause. And these are conjugated, so I might have to, I might get to, I, um, uh, I have to, yeah, often they're, co they're co co conjugated, like um, I have to have, I have to get, that kind of thing. With the direct object, which is the, the thing that's being acted upon in the sentence and some sort of main verb. Okay. Might have to go to the store. I um, caused the book to fall over. And these are mostly considered things that I, when I'm not doing the action myself, but I'm having someone else do the action. Right? So I might have to call the vet um, <clears throat> to confirm our appointment. So the vet is doing the confirming, but I am like causing that action to happen. So here's an example. I had him paint my house. Um, so him, here's the direct object, and paint is the main verb. Now in these scenarios, the cause is the person who does the action, so he is the painter. The cause er with the R here is the person who's required the action, and that would be me. And what we're going to use as our example is um, what translates roughly into English as do versus let in Dutch. So we um, this doesn't quite work in English, right? Because um, I can't say I, like let is permissive, but do is also kind of a form of permissive in Dutch. And so it do is more of a direct causation. You're having someone do something for you. Um, so the rough translation, if the energy is put in, the result is inevitable. Okay. So I'm having, um, I, having someone help me code articles. Okay. That would be a do direct causation. Okay. And so a loose translation for Dutch. He reminded me of my father. The causation is involuntary. It's going to happen. Okay. Now let here is an indirect causation. Can you yourself out? Sorry, I thought we were about to get a visit. Let is an indirect causation, so it's more about enablement and permission. I let him paint my house. Are you done barking? Do you guys want to say hello to the barker? Oh, he's running away. Just kidding. He might, if he comes back. <clears throat> so I let him paint my house, or I let the dog walk away, hoping he will calm down. Now, why do these things, why do we have these sorts of words? Because it seems kind of weird, right? So they could um, be useful as like a state or an action, right? So does the verb, does the, the um, have, get, causative construction, the conjugation, apply to a state verb, meaning it's a state of being, or an action verb, painting is an action verb, okay? reminded is a state of being. What type of verb is it? Is it transitive? Does it require a direct object? Is it intransitive? Or it can't really be both. Or um, ditransitive requires a direct and an indirect object. <clears throat> it could be about the action itself. So does the person who's doing the action have the control? Can they choose to do it? Do they act willingly? And how are they affected? could be about the person causing the action. So it could be the directness of it, like I forced him to paint my house. Or the um, intention, it's intentional or accidental. Okay. And it's a natural activity or requires effort. Okay. And then how much does the causer, the person requiring the action, get involved? So I let him paint my house, I'm not getting involved, he's doing the paint. And so all of those might be variables that we could use to predict which one people should um, choose. And so I would say most chat boxes are made by um, applying a set of grammar rules to a kind of neural net model um, or a predictive model. But these might be kind of the scenarios that one uses to finesse that sort of thing, to make it seem more realistic. 
because picking the wrong one is often an indicator that the, the text is fake or it's a second language speaker. So a lot of these things are seen, but people don't understand the subtlety and the difference of the synonyms. <clears throat> right. So what we could say is if we know, what we know about Dutch here is that if it's a mental causer to a mental causey, that means a human, so a human acting upon a human, it's going to be more about enablement, letting someone do something. Okay. That's considered an inducive scenario. I'm inducing them to do it. If a mental causer is working on a non-mental causey, so I um, let the book, uh, or I let my parking pass expire, okay, that's non-mental, it's kind of neither scenario, it's volitional. Okay. So do versus let are neither, neither of those, is, they're kind of equally likely. In an effective scenario, a non-mental causer affects a mental causey. Okay. The car uh, let me go. That doesn't make a lot of sense. I should come up with better ones for these. Um, let me think. The book made me cry. That's kind of an example one, right? Uh, it's more of a do scenario in Dutch. Again, remember these don't translate quite the way we use them in English. Or it could be physical, so non-mental to non-mental is more likely to be due. Okay, so these are our predictions based on all of those coded variables. Can we recreate them using an analysis? Okay. So what we're going to use is log regression. Okay. Log regression is very popular in analytics as the math for machine learning. Log regression is not machine learning. <laughs> There, machine learning is a procedure to me, a set of steps that one does, and there's some math involved. And logistic regression happens to be a very popular version of that math, right? There's also support vector machines, gradient boosting, blah, other stuff <laughs> I've forgotten now, naive bays, that kind of stuff. Okay. So we're going to talk about using logistic regression as a statistical analysis. And then later we'll do an example where we use log as the math for our machine learning. Okay. And so I try to keep these kind of pretty separate. I, I'm mostly a statistician at heart. I've done a little bit of machine learning. Um, but either way, it's a predictive tool. And the way that you interpret and use that predictive tool is different by different fields. So in linear regression, um, what we are looking at is uh, predicting some sort of continuous outcome. So y hat sub i here is the participant's score. Okay. And so if I have a continuous outcome, that makes sense. So let's say I'm trying to predict your final grade, right? That's a continuous score. And I'm trying to figure out what it would be. Okay. Then we've got b naught or b0, which is the y-intercept when all variables, when all x variables are zero. B1, which is the slope given the first predictor, X1. B2 for the second predictor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, plus some small form of residual or error, given that we almost never get everyone's score exactly right. Okay. So if we add the error, we're getting back to the participant's original score. And we want the equation that best minimizes the error, so this is called least squares. Logistic regression is that exact same model, but on the logic. Okay. And so we're predicting some sort of categorical outcome, um, and so it is a function of y. So let's look at that a little more. The main distinction between logistic and linear regression is the dependent variable. So in logistic regression, the outcome is categorical. It can be binary for a um, binary logistic regression or um, multinomial for more than two. Okay. And so this is a function of the log, or the log odds of the outcome. Um, so two options really, binomial or binary, and then more than two options, multinomial or sometimes called polytomous regression. Most people use polytomous when they're talking about item response theory but item response theory is logistic regression on steroids, so same idea. Okay. 
So g sub uh, g, the function g of y represents the odds of one choice over another. And that's like, you know, if sports were going on right now, this is easy representations like sports betting. So which one's more likely, do or left? Okay, what are the odds of do versus versus in comparison to left? Otherwise, this is basically a linear model. Okay, b sub zero is the intercept. It's the chances of the outcome when all the predictors are zero. And this is not a probability, this is an, a ratio. So it might be six to one or 10 to one. Okay, if it's a log odds, um, it's centered around zero, but these numbers get bigger than one. So they're not probabilities, they're odds. Odds can get big, probabilities cannot. Okay. B sub one is the slope for the x variable, or it's called sometimes called coefficient. Um, <clears throat> B sub two would be the second variable, et cetera, and then we have the errors. Okay. Um, <clears throat> wait, oh, I was like, what is this sentence here? So we're gonna add, and I'm gonna give you some explanations of how to interpret these predictors to help us understand the likelihood of the outcome. So the data here is categories on categories, so we're gonna learn how to interpret that. Okay. So what are the requirements for logistic regression as a statistical analysis or as a mathematical tool, right? You do need a large enough sample size for the outcome variable. It is always, always, always very difficult to predict the smaller category. When the ratio between categories becomes large, it um, mathematically becomes stupid to predict the smaller category. Okay, so let's say you have uh, 10 to 1 odds, okay, where the large category has 100 and the small category has 10. Why would you ever guess the small category? Right? You're going to be wrong very, very little. And so when those scenarios happen, I always tell people to randomly sample from the larger data set um, if you cannot get more of the smaller data set. But this is also true as a mathematical tool for machine learning. You do not want a heavy imbalance between um, categories. Okay? Even if their natural ratios are small, it, it becomes important to try to predict those. You're usually trying to predict the small one anyway. Uh, so, like examples right now, with um, understanding the prediction of COVID, right, only a certain proportion of people get sick. We don't actually know what that proportion is for lots of reasons, but let's say it's small. Okay. But we still want to know what, we still want to be able to predict that category. So we're going to find something to do to overcome that, and often people will randomly sample okay, to see. Okay, so you do have to have a large enough sample size. How big? You know, it can't be, it's got to be greater than five. <laughs> it's like a minimum. But you do want, um, I think it's 10 uh, instances per predictor is an, as a rule I've seen. Um, but obviously, the larger, the better. So this data set's in our link. And I have just printed out a little table here so we can look at it. It's, the ratio here is pretty good. It's not perfectly even, but it's pretty even and the sample sizes are not tiny. So we're doing pretty good. I'm going to use the RMS package. There are lots of ways to do logistic regression in R. Okay, we're gonna do two of them for two different reasons. Um, so I like RMS, regression models basically, uh, because it gives you some statistics that the regular GLM base R functions do not. Okay. So let's look at the data here. All right, we've got aux, the auxiliary verb here. The, the conjugated verb is either do or let. We've got the country, it's either the Netherlands or Belgium. Okay, so we've got a cultural variable there. They have um, inherent differences. We've got the type of causation. It's inducive, physical, effective, or volitional. And then we have the transitivity of the verb. It is either intransitive or transitive. In the data set, there's also a second column called EP trans one, and that is an example from the textbook about multicollinearity, so we're actually not gonna use it. It's a perfect copy of EP trans. Okay. So let's build a model. Well, the models here, when we run them, run exactly like 
any other linear models. We looked at, we did this code when we did trees. So y is approximated by my x variable, so we're just going to add them together. That approximation, that's the tilde, it's above the tab on a QWERTY keyboard. So I'm saying, well, the auxiliary variable is predicted by the type of causation, the transitivity of the verb, and the country. So we have a we have oops sorry we have a semantic variable right the situation I have a syntax variable the type of verb and I have a um uh <laughs> brain just took a fart uh country variable um cultural variable the country it's in so LRM for logistic regression model and then the name of the data set. Now here's the reason I like this. This code output is just like brilliantly simple. Okay, we're gonna talk about this model likelihood test ratio section here. We're gonna talk about the discrimination indices and the concordance index, and then the coefficients here. So we're gonna break this down one piece at a time. So the frequency here, what variable is first? This is useful. So I'm only going to have you guys do binomial, but these functions and models will do multinomial as well. Um, but this code here, it's basically like running a little table, but it also shows me only the ones included. So if your data has missing data, it'll get dropped. And so this shows me the sort of final ratio. So I'm good still. And I know which one is the lower coded group. So the comparison here is going to be do to let, because we're going to compare the, the higher group to the lower group. And by higher, I just mean like it's coded as the 0 and then 1, okay, which is what R naturally does for factor variables. Is the model predictive? Well, I can look at the likelihood ratio text uh, test, which is a chi-square test. This is similar to the F test in regression, and it tells me um, how much this model is better than a model of no predictors. So how much of the error variance has decreased from having no predictors to having these predictors. I can print out all those statistics again by doing model dollar sign stats, where we can just go back and look here. It's all right here. So the chi-square test with five degrees of freedom, yeah, that's 271, and that is statistically significant. So that implies that these predictors are better than nothing. <laughs> so <coughs> that's good. Now I have to figure out how and why that happens. <coughs> Excuse me. For goodness of fit, I can tell how useful this model is, better than nothing. So I, I really like effect sizes. Um, I think they're, they're really handy and they're kind of what's lost a lot in analytics personally um, because a lot of times people talk about how models are predictive but they don't tell you how predictive and they don't tell you what variables are predictive, they're just predictive. I'm like, well, that doesn't mean anything to me. <laughs> like, it, I mean, almost everything can be better than chance. So. I mean, shoe size predicts IQ better than chance. Well, it's not very useful. Like, how useful is it, right? So that's what an effect size tells me. I can look here at R squared. Where did it go? R2 here. This is a pseudo R squared. Okay, so it's Nagel-Kirk pseudo R squared, which is the most popular one for logistic regression. And that, it's called a pseudo R-squared because normally what R-squared means is it's the relationship between the predictive variable and the, the actual variable. And so it's actually a correlation of how close we're getting to the person's predicted score. But in our case, this is a, a categorical variable. And so it's almost like um, it's, it's not exactly a, a percent correct, it's meant to mimic that idea of variance accounted for. So R squared often is thought of like, how much variance in the DV am I accounting for by my IVs? And bigger is better. If you got, you know, 90% of the variance, you'd be doing really well. 
And so this statistic is meant to kind of represent that concept, but it is not literally that concept, so that's why it's called pseudo R squared. And I would say 61%, I would lose my mind as a behavioral scientist. Um, that would be an amazing number. I think depending on what you're doing, that varies. Right? So I would say this is pretty, pretty high. With three variables, I can predict which one it is, do versus let, pretty well. One more thing we can look at is the concordance index. And that is this variable C here. So spoiler, it's 0.89. And so for each outcome, each sentence, a probability of uh, do, because it's the let first and then do, is created. Okay. So the probability of the, the higher group. Okay. And if that probability is over 50%, it will code it into the higher group. If it's less than 50%, it will code it into the lower group. Okay. Does this make sense? It's the basic idea of the logic. And so C is the number of times that the um, probability actually matches that dichotomous outcome. Okay. So it's effectively a measure of accuracy, okay, if you're familiar with that. Okay. At 0.5 in a binomial scenario, that is no discrimination. So less than 0.5, you're doing worse than a coin flip. Okay. 0.7 to 0.8 is often considered acceptable. You're getting 70 to 80% right. 8 to 9 is excellent, and above 0.9 is outstanding. You're doing very well predicting the outcome. So, so far I have three different indicators. I have my statistical significance, better than nothing. I have my R squared, which is quite high, and I have uh, somewhere between excellent and outstanding concordance index. So those three goodness of fit measures give me a good idea that this model is working pretty well. But I still haven't told you why the model works well, so let's look at our coefficients. Okay. So under coif in the output, these numbers are the log odds of the outcome. Okay. So an odds ratio is centered around one. So this is sports betting, six to one odds, four to one odds. Okay. Log odds ratios are centered around zero. This makes it more like your traditional coefficient or correlation. Um, they can still get bigger than one though. So if the coefficient is zero, there is no relationship between the predictor and the outcome. Okay, the variable is totally useless at predicting the outcome. If the number is positive, that implies that there is a higher probability for the coded group. And the coded group is the group that is second. Uh, control, coded. Negative numbers indicate there's a higher probability for the comparison group, which is coded first. Okay. And so if I think about this being 0 and this being 1, if it's positive, it's pushed towards the 1. If it's negative, it's pushed towards the 0. And I can look at that by looking at the levels, looking at the, the model stats that we looked at already, frequency here. So whichever one is second is the coded group. So positive numbers go here, negative numbers go there. Coefficients. There. And so I just cut and pasted them here so we could look at it. Okay. Now, if all of the predictors are zero, which is a little weird in this scenario because the predictors are, are categorical, but if all the predictors are zero, there is kind of, um, it's twice as likely almost for the second group. But most people don't interpret the intercept because in, often x being 0 doesn't make any sense. Okay. So instead, let's look here. I got three predictors for causation. Why did that happen? Well, what we've got here, and I'm going to talk about this more um, next week, is dummy coding. So what's actually happening is there's four different categories for... Um, the causation variable, it's effective, inducive, physical, or volitional. And when that is included in a uh, statistical equation, you end up with comparisons. So when it says causation equals inducive, what's actually happening is it's the, it's the comparison of inducive to effective. 
Why is it to the first one? That's the natural coding scenario in R. You can change that, um, but it always compares it back to the first one. Okay, so just like we're doing do versus let, because let is the first one, it's inducive versus effective, and then physical versus effective, and volitional versus effective. If I wanted a different combination, I would just reorder the levels using the factor command or reorder or relevel. There are several functions that will do this. And I could change them and rerun my analysis and see a different comparison. So if you wanted to compare physical versus volitional, you needed to move one of them to the front of the line, so to speak. And that is called dummy coding. So when we do linear regression, we'll talk more about dummy coding. There are lots of types of coding um, combinations, but this is one of the most popular because it makes sense. These are like mini t-tests. Or in this particular scenario, they're like many chi-squares. So what does this mean? Well, for the first one I have, effective versus inducive, it's negative. So as um, we move from infective to inducive, so when we compare those two, we're getting a, a likelihood that's negative. So that means more likely to be left. And I, you know, like I can always look at these numbers and I can be like, mm, I. Mm, Okay, I can tell you it's more likely to be let, but is it more likely to be let for effective or for inducive? Well, don't think that hard. Instead, make a table of the categorical outcomes and look at the numbers. This is not brain surgery. So let's concentrate here on these first four cells. So we know it's more likely to be let because the number is negative. And if I look at these four numbers here, these two versus these two, what's happening is when it's inducive, it is way more likely to be let. Look how big this number is. It's 160 versus 15 or even 160 versus 25. Like that number, it's way bigger than the rest. Okay, so the probability of it being let, inducive versus effective, is much higher. That makes the reverse also true it's more likely to be due for effective. And if you rearrange the variables and rerun the numbers, what you'll see is this number will flip to positive. For physical here, there's no difference. So if I compare effective, this column, to physical, this column, they have the same basic pattern of results. For volitional, it's also negative, And what we see is it's way more likely, again, to be left. Now, if I look at these numbers, it's 15 to 75 and then 98 to 19. Now, 98 and 75 are not really that different of a number, but the ratios are what we're really looking at. And so we see that in a volitional scenario, it's much more likely to be let. It's not going to be um, due. Okay. So that's how we'd interpret that. So in inducive and volitional scenarios, it's more likely to be let. Um, physical doesn't matter. Does that match? So in physical and volitional is what we said, it's more likely to be let. Hmm. <laughs> so it doesn't really match our, our expected predictions. Let me make sure I said that right. We were here. So inducive and volitional, more likely to be let. Well, let's go back to our prediction. Inducive, this one matches. Volitional, that doesn't match. Okay. So we got a half rate. Yep. Okay, so this one matches what we expected. This one does not. Okay. These two also match because they're more likely to be due. The reverse is also true. Um, but actually for physical, there's no um, prediction. So that one doesn't match. So we got these two right. All right. Now let's try the other ones. These are easier because there's only two of them. So for transitivity, what we see is a negative variable. So that's also more likely to be let. Okay. And this one presents an interesting scenario. It's not an equal flip back and forth, right? In the other scenario, what we saw was like, you know, one of them's clearly due and the other one's clearly let and they're very distinct. In this one, if it's intransitive, it's actually pretty equal. But when it's a transitive variable, right, it's going to be let. So 
So the ratio here is much more probable for let. The ratio here is equally probable. Now country-wise, this is significant but not as big as some of the other ones. Um, it's much more likely to be Belgium for the positive this time, so do. Okay. And so if we look here, um, it looks a lot like let is more popular for the Netherlands and do is more popular for Belgium. So this number is bigger than this one but the ratio is the interesting part. Okay. So let is way more popular for the Netherlands and do is a bit more popular for Belgium. Okay. Looking this way. And so that's how you can interpret categorical predictors predicting categorical outcomes. Now in logistic regression, you can also use continuous outcomes, but I kind of stuck with a little bit of the harder scenario to interpret. Also, in linguistic data, often the variables are categories as well. Okay. And we'll do some examples of continuous predicting, continuous variables predicting stuff. All right. The other thing I want to cover is interactions. So if I think there are a bunch of interactions in the data, I should actually probably start with a conditional inference tree to prune out some variables that may not be useful and think about the interactions. Um, if I have a certain prediction about interactions, I could just code them directly. Okay. Now with interactions, we should use the GLM package. Now the RMS package will do interactions, but it won't work with these, uh, this next cool function I'm going to show you. So we're going to switch to GLM. I like GLM a lot. It just doesn't provide concordance indexes and you know, but GLM is pretty flexible because I can actually tell it what kind of distribution or what kind of family or linking function I'm expecting. In this case, it's binomial because we have two options. Okay. Um, sometimes people pick other types of distributions like, uh, for other scenarios. Okay. Uh, all right, so GLM for general linear model. Um, I do the same type of model formula we did before. We tell it specifically, hey, this is a binomial family, so give me a logistic model. Um, and the data set is still the same. Okay. Let's say we think that there's an interaction between transitivity and country. So maybe each country uses those vari transitive variables differently. And so we throw in a little star here. Okay. The star means we're going to get each variable by itself and their cross product. Now, first question, is it useful to put in that interaction? So I already know that the base model is useful because we've already looked at those statistics. Is it useful to add the interaction? Now I can compare those models directly with the ANOVA function, which is hysterical because it's not actually an ANOVA. I mean, I guess it is. It's a comparison of models, but it's not ANOVA as most people think about ANOVA. Right? Um, but, you know, most people forget that ANOVA is just a, a general linear model, but that's a different rant on a different day. So we're going to tell it to give us a chi-square test. Okay. So what that does is it calculates the, um, the residuals, how much error there is for the model without the interaction then the residuals for the models with the interaction and subtracts them. Okay. So this number here, 3.11, is the literal difference mathematically between these two. We've just added one variable, the interaction, so there's one degree of freedom, and that is not significant. Okay. 3.84 would be p equals 0.05. Okay. So it looks like the addition of the interaction is maybe not um, statistically significant. We could look at our R squared to see if it adds a practical amount of significance. Okay. But I just want to show you kind of how it looks here when you add the interaction. So all of this is um, the original variables. Notice that they change just a little bit because of that inclusion of the interaction. And then you'll also get the final interaction component okay, between the two variables. Now interpreting this number is practically impossible. Okay, it's positive, 
but it's three variables at once now. It's the categorical do versus let, the categorical transitivity, and the categorical country. So like interpreting that single number is not super helpful. So instead, what we can do is, I love this package so much. It's a VisRay package for visualizing regressions. You can use it for lots of things, but one of the things it truly shines at, other than ugly colors, is um, uh, visualizing simple slopes is what they're called. So the function here is the model, and the model with the interaction. The variable you want to put on the uh, y-axis here, uh, if that's continuous, it'll give you a couple of slopes. By here is the facet wrap in ggplot terms or the split. So I have intransitive versus transitive. Okay, so intransitive versus transitive. And this is kind of the uh, function of transitivity. So this is y hat out here. And that interaction isn't significant, but what's happening that puts it kind of close is um, there is a larger difference in probabilities for the Netherlands. Okay, they're much more likely to use the intransitive than in Belgium. They're pretty equal in their use. And so I love this package. If all the lines line up perfectly straight across the middle, then there's no interaction. The further apart they get, the more um, the patterns being different creates an interaction. So if there's one up here and one down here and both of them, no interaction. So you're kind of seeing if each panel has a different set of patterns. It makes visualizing interaction much easier because interpreting the one number doesn't mean a whole lot. All right. Now, with any statistical model, I have to be concerned about the quality of the data. This is why I have my giant garbage in, garbage out poster behind me. And so I have to be interested in what are called outliers in the solution. We're going to do this again for linear regression because I love the influence plot. It's so great. Um, so this is mainly a set of tools that help you visualize that I just happen to really like. Um, this is in the car library, which does just about everything. And it creates me this really cool picture of the um, measures of outlierness in the data. So there are three parts here. Let's see. Um, the studentized residuals here is the measure of the difference between the like the outcome and the predicted outcome. Now that's easy in your linear model. Let's say I predicted you got a B and you got an A. It would be the subtraction of that. In a, in a logistic model, it's essentially the logit, the, the probability of do versus let, minus the group code. So if you said the probability is 0.67 and the group code is 1, you have 0.33, right? If you said the, the group, the probability is 0.99 minus 1, it's very small. Okay. So it essentially tells you how far away from you are from predicting it perfectly as 0 or 1. And then studentized, it's um, standardized. Because it's a z-score, things outside of 2, tend to be considered outliers, and that's why they has the dashed lines here at 2. The x-axis here are hat values, or what are called leverage. Okay. Leverage is a measure of the influence on the slope. Okay. So how much it's, per, it's changing the log odds with the inclusion of that variable. Okay. Essentially, numbers that are large are bad. So if you include a specific data point and they change the slope a lot, that means they have a lot of influence, which is not good. Because one data point should not change the leverage, like change the slope. So it's called leverage because it's changing the, the lever of the slope. If you think about cars um, and levering them up. Okay. Um, I, I also think about politics in this because the terms are very political. You don't want a single data point to have leverage or influence on your results. So larger values are bad, and it draws you the cutoff score. Okay, the cutoff score is based on the number of uh, data points and the number of predictors. 
Okay, so it draws it for you out here. It's 2k plus 2, so 2 times predictors plus 2 divided by sample size. Now the last statistic that's present visually on this graph is the size of the bubbles, and that's Cook's values. Okay, Cook's values is the measure of leverage plus distance. Okay, distance is just how different it is practically from everyone else. Distance makes a lot more sense um, in continuous data. So let's say you had everyone um, in a class made B and you have one person who made 100. Okay, they're very far away score-wise from everyone else. That's a measure of distance. There's a big gap in the data. Um, <clears throat> Uh, not Euclidean. Well, I don't, you know, practically, I'm not sure if I know how Cook's is calculated. As far as I understand it, it's a measure, it might be Euclidean. Can it be Euclidean? Because it's multi-dimensional space. Hmm. That's a good question. I don't think I know the answer, to be 100% honest. Yep, don't know. <laughs> I have to look it up what Cook's is. Um, how Cook's is calculated. How is Cook's distance calculated? Let's see what Wikipedia knows here. Combination of each small residual. Hmm. Oh, it's practically calculated from leverage and residuals. So, no. But effectively the idea is how far away it is from the rest of the data points. Um, I did not know that. I did not know that. That is a thing I've learned today. <laughs> the leverage and the residuals. But a data point that's very far away from everyone else tends to have a high residual. Unless it's perfectly in line with the equation. Uh, all right. So the bubbles here represent the bigger the bubble, the more uh, it crosses a cutoff score. Again, the cutoff scores are based on sample size and predictors. And for that one, it's, oh gosh, four divided by n minus k minus one. Things you do not have to know, but um, they both include the, the number of predictors as a penalty and the, the sample size. Because the larger the sample size, the less influence a single slope point can have. Now, all of that taken together, how do I know which ones are bad? Well, it labels them for you very helpfully, variables that have multiple indicators. Okay. So things that are sort of um, outside or bad on, on several of them. And then it prints them down here for you. And the number here is the row, the row number. So I could go back and rerun my analysis, excluding these rows, and see how different the, the answer is. Now, I'm always pro-transparency. If I do that, I tend to try to present both results um, so people don't think I'm trying to cheat, basically. Now, I uh, also am very pro-deleting people whose scores are crazy. Because if their scores are hard to predict or are very far out from everybody else are they scores you're actually trying to predict so I work a lot with participant real people data and real people freshmen college freshmen are often taking your studies because they have to or they're just like rushing through like click 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 so for for me it makes a lot of sense to exclude people whose scores seem uh, inauthentic okay. and there are other ways to check for that as well but outliers are a good prediction. I, these are not scores that I can predict very well, and here are some reasons why they might be bad. Okay. Um, so in, inattentive responding is also problematic. Okay. Now, words here cannot be inattentive. <laughs> so these are, these are, it would be interesting to go back and look at the scenarios in which these occur. So the sentences themselves to see if there's a certain um, another variable that really captures what's happening there. So this sometimes is a useful measure to find that other predictor that you're missing. Well, all of these have this in common, so that's the variable we're missing here. All right. 
Some other, observ uh, other assumptions of logistic regression include that the observations are independent, okay, meaning sentence one does not influence sentence two, or in other data scenarios, participant one is not the same data as participant two. If that's not true, there are other analyses that you can run using like a multi-level logistic regression. Okay. Um, you don't want multicollinearity. So multicollinearity is when two variables are highly correlated. If you're using two variables that basically are the same thing, you're wasting your time. Okay, you're losing power, and you're essentially using the same variable twice. You don't want to do that. Uh, I have seen multiple rules for VIF, which is the variance inflation factor. Uh, anything bigger than point, uh, 0.5, no point, just 5, or 10 is often considered bad. And that just depends on who you talk to, if it's 5 or 10. You can't go wrong with five. Uh, the variance inflation factor, sometimes people talk about this as tolerance. Tolerance is one over VIF, and you want numbers that are very small. So I can calculate the VIF on my model right, by running uh, RMS VIF. Okay, that is a little different than CAR's version of VIF, so be sure you use the right one. And all of these are less than five, so we're okay. Because it does not make a lot of sense to run a correlation on the categorical variables. Uh, when we do this for linear regression, we'll run literally a correlation table. We can look at that. The other assumption that you have to be careful for, and this is difficult in logistic regression, and I think this happens a lot um, sometimes when people use thousands of variables. <clears throat> because you're not, you know, you're just trying to predict, you're not trying to come up with um, the why, um, as over prediction. Okay. So I, I don't want to blame this on analytics, because it's not an analytics problem. It's a, an outcome-focused problem. Okay. So if you're trying very hard to predict something, for whatever reason, stocks, sports betting, whatever, okay. politics, good example here, politics. So trying to predict the outcome, and we have hundreds of predictors. What we can sometimes, or small number of predictors, the size of the data set is not um, indicative of this. Uh, sometimes what can happen is what's called either complete or quasi-complete separation of the data, meaning you have a perfect predictor. So you have some other variable that essentially separates the data, meaning um, it only occurs in this for group one, or only occurs for group two. That's a very useful piece of information, but it will blow up your models. Sometimes you don't notice that it's blown up your models if you don't investigate the individual predictors. So how can you tell that it's blown up a model? Well, for that I gotta go back okay. and look at the standard errors. So one thing I always caution people against using thousands of predictors, kind of machine learning models, and you get these perfect outcomes, is be suspicious, right? Um, because if you have a perfect separator variable, that won't maybe won't generalize to other scenarios. Maybe it will, but maybe it won't. Um, and the, the, the thing to look at here is standard error. If all of the standard errors are small and one of them is very, very large and the scale of the data is not that large, be suspicious. So what do I mean? Let's say you have a 1 to 10 scale okay, and the standard error is 5,000. That is not mathematically possible. Now in these models, sometimes that will happen because the, the way that it's tried to um, solve the closed form solution is not, it's blown up this overprediction problem or multicollinearity problem. Um, if you have a 1 to 10 scale and the standard error is 2, okay. It's not a very useful variable, it's a big standard error, but okay. If you have a 1 to 100 scale and the standard error is 50, okay, that's a terrible predictor, but still within the range. So you have to remember the scale of the data, right, um, and then the size of the standard error. In our scenario here, the scale of the data is small. It can be either one, two, three, or four, so to speak. And so standard errors um, here represent this kind of just that size of the fact that these are categorical. If my standard errors on any of these were much larger, 5, 10, 15, 20, I would get nervous. 
because that implied that the model, um, there's something that it couldn't solve, basically. And so that's how you can look for overprediction. It's not the only way, but that's just a kind of a quick and easy way to look for separation in the data. Okay. Is the, the other variables will groan <laughs> and the standard errors will represent, will show you what happened. Okay. And you see this a lot in structural equation modeling as well. All right, so let's look at this very briefly in Python, um, mostly because we're going to use this code to do a machine learning example. Now, I would say if you're going to do statistics, which is what we just did, right, small statistical models focused only on predicting that sample, okay, more academic style, then use R. It has way more tools, way more cool stuff, presents the data in a way that most people do for statistical results. Okay. If you're going to use logistic regression in more of a machine learning style, you can do that in R, but it works really well in Python to um, work with very large data sets. Okay. So uh, briefly, so we've talked before about how R does natural dummy coding for us. And so it takes that column and converts it into this cool demi code stuff and awesome, moves on with life. Python, we have to do that ourselves. So we've practiced this once already with our conditional inference tree with one hot encoding. We don't want one hot encoding or our models will not run. So don't do that. Instead, what we want to do is dummy coding. And when we do linear regression, I'll show you more about that difference. But remember that one hot encoding has the number of columns is equal to the number of categories. And that's what you get naturally with the get dummies function. Um, I told this not, uh, yeah. So see, causative effective, causative inducive. It's going to have causative volitional and causative physical and have the one in the column that represents the data. That's called one hot encoding. Okay. Um, as you can see, here are the columns. Dummy coding means that the, the, there is a, each combination gets a unique barcode is the way I think about this. So if it's effective, it's zero, zero, zero. Okay. If it's inducive, it's one, zero, zero, okay. one, zero, zero. If it's physical, it's zero, one, zero. If it's volitional, zero, zero, one. That's a perfect set of codes. I actually don't need that first column. So for dummy coding, you get categories minus one columns. So if I have four categories, I get three of them. And that's why we saw three of them in our output earlier in our, our logistic model. So the get dummies function is, does one hot, we want to get back to dummy coding. So you just basically drop the other columns. Okay, so I dropped the effective column so I could make this analysis the same as my R one. I dropped intransitive and I dropped the Netherlands, so I dropped the first one of each one. And so now my predictors match before, and for Y, I dropped the first one. Um, so now I have do versus let. Because if it's a zero, it's let. If it's a one, it's do. To run this model, this is Python, so the first thing you do is import and build a blank model. Uh, so here, our blank model. We're going to uh, stick with this solver. This is actually, I think, the default now, but sometimes it yells at you. So right in this solver. Most of the defaults work fine for us here. Um, you might have to turn up iterations if you have a complex model. Um, Multi-class here will handle either two or more. So just let it do auto, that kind of thing. Then we fit it to the data. Because we're treating this as a statistical analysis, we fit it to the whole data set. Cross-validation is always good. Like I'm, I'm never going to say that that's a bad thing. But generally, if I'm treating this as statistics uh, instead of machine learning, um, I just fit it on the whole data and just kind of see what happens. Better to have multiple data sets. Always, always. Okay, so fit um, x to y here. So it's kind of backwards to R because we do Y is approximated by X, but in Python, it's always X comma Y. 
Now, I have not found a nice way, they're in there somewhere, to get the coefficients. I think I actually have them here, uh, coef here. So I can get those coefficients back out. So it's the, um, so it does not show me the intercept, but it shows me those coefficients. I do notice that they're slightly different than um, what we found before, but not terribly because of the solver part of it. Now, if I want to look at like how good my model is, I would have to manually calculate all of those numbers. So I'd have to figure out what the pseudo R squared calculations are, and then I'd have to figure out my deviant statistics and do that F statistic. There's not a simple function that gives me my um, goodness of fit measures. I can calculate accuracy because there is an embedded function in scikit-learn's metrics package um, that will let me do accuracy. So I tell it to predict. I get my predicted scores. And then I compare my real score to my predicted score. Okay, so I can do a little confusion matrix. So here's the ones I'm getting right. This is just like our conditional inference tree. Here are the ones I'm getting wrong. So I'm getting more of what the second category do uh, let let, let is first, sorry, do is second, so I'm getting more of let wrong. I can calculate my accuracy, so it's 86%. My concordance index and my other one was 89%, so I'm actually doing a little better with my R package, which uses a slightly different mathematical solver, so that's why they're just a little bit different. I can print out my coefficients. They're approximately the same. Okay, they give me the same pattern of results. Um, but no p-values, okay. so I don't get my, I can't see standard errors, I can't look at which ones are the useful ones, I just know, like, here they are, I could probably backwards configure the, the, um, p-values from these, but it would, I would have to figure out the standard error, so, like, to me, if I'm doing this as a statistical focus, where I'm telling you which predictor is important, not just that I can predict, but which one is the good one. Um, R is going to be much better for this. All right. So a quick caveat. Okay. Often people are doing um, machine learning algorithms where we just have tons and tons of variables and we're just trying to see if we can get a good prediction. Um, that has its merits and it is useful. I'm not saying it's wrong, <laughs> even though I am a statistician. Um, and so... I think because R is more of the statistics language and Python is more of the doing language, is the way I see people describe this, um, is that you just don't see the same built-in functions because people have kind of naturally migrated to one or the other. It's not like they don't exist, they're probably out there, but it's not quite as easy as R. There aren't 10 packages that do this. Um, so later in the semester, we're going to do some word to vec and we're going to do some machine learning, simple machine learning. So we're going to go back to this logistic regression code, which is why I wanted to bring it up now. But this section mostly focuses on thinking about this as a statistical prediction. Can I tell you if the model is better than nothing and then which variables are better than nothing? Because when we get into word to vec, the, the variables themselves are maybe not, they're not useful. They're not like, um, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. It's like this tensor column is useful. Like I, the, the column doesn't mean anything to me. So um, each of these scenarios depends on the type of data you have. Here we have clear predictors. Like I can tell you what they are. The variable is transitive or it's not. And so that to me makes it much more useful to know which one is useful. In a word to vec model where we build um, a neural net, those are abstract. So the goal there is just prediction because if I, I can't tell you which abstract thing it is, right? There, there's no real meaning there. And we'll cover that more later. So in summary, we can model word choice. I can tell you which one people are gonna pick. They're gonna pick do or let pretty accurately okay? with um, only two outcomes and only three variables because this is a very good example. A real life, maybe not so clear, um, but I could extend that to multinomial logistic. Mlogit is a really great 
function that does multinomial in an appropriate way. You can get GLM to do multinomial, but MLogit is much better. I actually have a whole video of myself talking about MLogit, and so if you want to do a final project with more than two outcomes in this style, I have like, some examples for you. So what have you learned statistically? You've learned how to think about logistic regression from a, from a, a, a prediction and what is important, sort of a theory building point of view, um, along with the assumptions, checks, and understanding the output, the outliers in the equation, I'm sorry, outliers in the solution that might tell you more about what to investigate next. And then we did very much the small, small amount of Python as a sort of preview for a later chapter.